Hello, everybody. I'm Mandy Whaley. I'm so excited to be here with you at DevNet Create, and I'm really looking forward to sharing with you some of the things that me and my whole team have been learning about building customer driven SDKs and APIs. So I'm part of the Azure DevTools team at Microsoft, and the team that I lead builds the Azure SDK for all the different Azure services. We work in Python and Java, JavaScript, .NET, and we also work on our tools for developers like Visual Studio and VS Code and how to make those tools work great with Azure. We also spend a lot of time on API design and work with groups across Microsoft on developer experience. I live in Austin, Texas. During the pandemic, I learned how to knit and I've knitted 20 plus hats. So I'm really looking forward to fall and it cooling down a little bit in Austin. I've also got three amazing dogs. You might hear them during the talk, who knows? Um, you can find me on Twitter and I'm always excited when people reach out. So before I dive into how we're building customer driven APIs and SDKs, I wanna introduce the group that I work in a little bit. So Microsoft Developer Division is we call it DevDiv, and it's responsible for most of the developer tooling that Microsoft ships. So like I said, Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, .NET, and Azure Developer Experience. And one of the things that I really enjoy about Developer Division is that it's an organization that has a culture that drives this learning versus knowing mindset. And that's really a present across all of Microsoft. But in DevDiv, we really bring this into how we build products and how we build tools for developers. And it's such a big part of our culture that our group has actually written two books about this. One is around the customer driven culture and really building this learning culture within an organization. And the other one is the customer driven playbook. And this is a book about how you can take some techniques and apply this to really understanding customers needs, whatever kind of tools or products you're working on. And these have been part of um, a really great learning journey that I've been on since I joined Microsoft and I wanted to share some of what I had learned with you. So I encourage you to check them out, read the books. They're great. We're going to cover like this much of um, introing some of the ideas. So definitely go check out the full book. At the center of this is an idea that to create, you need to create value for the customer to create value for a business. And you need to be um, feeding this like a feedback cycle, right? They both depend on each other. Creating value for the customer creates value for the business. Creating sustainable value for the business creates value for the customer. And so really understanding the customer's needs is at the core of what we're gonna look at next, which is called the hypothesis progression framework. This is a framework that we use in developer division and in our SDK team to really understand how developers are approaching problems, what kind of things they're trying to use in their workflows and how our tools can help them. So we, this quote really captures a lot of it for me, which is that we spend a lot of time capturing our assumptions and writing them down and formulating them into hypotheses that can be tested. And then we run a wide array of experiments uh, throughout our whole development process. And we keep on track to see if we're validating or invalidating our own hypotheses that we wrote. And just to help show kind of like how much this is a part of the way we um, interact and plan and, and develop and learn, we had more than 10,000 interactions between a dev dev employee and a customer last year. That's from a, a blog post from one of our team members, which is amazing. And so what I wanted to do today is walk you through um, some examples of this hypothesis progression framework and then talk about how we're using it in the SDK team. So there's multiple parts to the way this progression framework works. Really, there is a study of hypotheses that relate to the customers. Are you understanding who the customers are and what they need? What are the problems that those customers are facing? And then from there, you move into the more product focused phase where you're looking at concepts. What kind of concepts can you think of or would you put as a hypothesis to solve the problems that the customers are facing? What kind of features help make that concept real and help really solve those problems and are they effective? And then what's the business outcome that you're driving? So in the simple questions to think about for each one of these phases with customers, it's do the customers exist? Are our assumptions right about the type of customers we're talking to? What problems do they have? Are we understanding their needs and what's really frustrating them? Is there more work to do to understand, you know, where those friction points are? Concept. When you think of a concept, does this concept really solve the problem? 
are the customers finding value in it in that it solves the problem and how do we test that? The features, can you really successfully use this feature? Is the feature really coming through on the promise and are they satisfied with it? And then the business outcome, are you getting to the business outcome that you're looking for? And to really make it easy to kind of dive in and apply this hypothesis and really look at how you can go and test these different assumptions, we have some great sort of templates that you can use to build up the hypothesis for each phase. So for the customer phase, you're really looking at, we believe, because it's a hypothesis, it's an assumption, we believe that this type of customer are motivated by this motivation when doing a certain job to be done. And that is really kind of at the core of the formula that we'll look at as we go through the progression and framework. Once you know that the customer exists, then you can start testing the problem. We believe that this type of customer we just talked about uh, are frustrated when they're doing this job because of this specific problem. And here you're really working on narrowing in on what's the problem that the customer faces. And then the concept, this is where you have a concept that may solve some of that pain that the customer is facing, solve some of the problem. And you're writing a hypothesis around, we believe that this concept solves the problem. And then we'll know that that's true when we hit a certain criteria. What are you looking for to see that the concept actually works? Within the concept, there may be lots of different features, many different ways to go about solving the problem. And so you can have hypothesis for certain features. How is the customer using the feature? Are they successful with the feature? What's the criteria for knowing that they're successful? And then the business outcomes can be many things. It can be uh, you know, dollar driven. It can also be things like customer loyalty. Um, it really can be any kind of business objective outcome you're looking for. And again, important to have a criteria that lets you know when you're reaching that and, and how you validate that, that hypothesis. So what I would like to do next is look at a very general example, um, and then we will get progressively down into some specific SDK ones. But I wanted to start with a problem that I think a lot of people can relate to right now. This is a problem I've got at my household. Anybody else? Um, during the pandemic, we're staying in more, we're being super careful, we're ordering a lot more things. And because of that, we have a lot more cardboard boxes stacking up. And so I wanted to take this problem and really work it through those steps and write those hypotheses to look at, you know, how you would apply them to a problem that maybe, maybe some other people besides me are also experiencing. So for the customer, Remember, we're looking for a type of customer, a motivation, and a job to be done. So the way I took this hypothesis is, we believe that people ordering more packages during the pandemic, that's our, that's our target customer, are motivated to quickly break down the boxes while they're processing their cardboard for recycling, right? We're trying to get it into whatever your city requires for recycling, but you have a lot of it to do. So we could test that hypothesis and find out are people really um, doing it for recycling or are they using it to, for other purposes? Is it really the pandemic that's causing this to happen because it's more packages? What's really going on there? And then we would get into the problem. What's the problem that they face? And my hypothesis for this problem is that the people ordering the packages are frustrated when they're breaking it down because the amount has increased. It's like so much to deal with versus the amount of cardboard that I'm used to dealing with at home. My home process does, it does not scale for the number of boxes that we have showing up each day. So we could go and test that. Is that really the problem or is there some other problem that um, is actually at the root of what's causing the issue for people? Then the concept. So a concept that I think could solve this. Um, and then how will we know if the concept is actually solving the problem? So for my hypothesis for my cardboard box problem, I've come up with a concept called the home scale cardboard baler. There's these things for industrial scale that like help you bail your cardboard up really neatly and don't take a lot of interaction. But there doesn't seem to be anything that exists for, you know, your household. So my concept is a home scale cardboard baler. This will solve this increased need for cardboard processing. It'll help us do it faster. And we'll know that that's true if we can get to a 50% reduction in the time to process the cardboard. So that's an example of a, of a concept hypothesis. Then the feature. 
So for the feature, I need to actually think about like how I'm going to um, accomplish this. How am I going to make it faster for them? And then are the customers really being successful in using it? So for my feature, um, I came up with a feature called Auto Crush. And we believe people ordering packages during the pandemic will be successful in solving their problem using Auto Crush, which is like throw your boxes in, push a button, it crushes it, makes a nice little cardboard bale that I can send to my recycling. And we'll know if this is successful when we see people actually being able to use the Auto Crush feature and getting those Auto Crush bales. And then for my business outcome, since this is a you know early part phase of this uh, venture, I decided to focus on customer loyalty. What I really want to see as an outcome is growing a loyal customer base who's going to talk about the home scale baler on social media and hopefully refer other customers to our site. So, um, you know, real problem, a little bit, you know, uh, tongue in cheek on. I don't think I'm actually going to build a home scale cardboard baler, but I think someone should because I actually need this this product. Um, but hopefully, it gives you a really great way to think about. You could take it to a problem maybe that you see that's tech or not tech related and how you could actually kind of phrase those hypotheses. So the other important part about this is that there is a progression throughout all of those stages. You're formulating the hypothesis. You're running lots of experiments to try to invalidate or validate your hypothesis. And then you're doing sense making, which is the bringing back in the data and really making your observations and, and making sense out of it and thinking about how that informs the next step in the process. And sometimes you may loop back to earlier steps and then go forward again. This is really similar to the iterative kind of build, measure, learn cycle that a lot of us are probably familiar with. So now I'd like to dive in a little bit to how we use this in the Azure DevTools team. Now that we've got a basis for understanding what these hypotheses look like and how we kind of work through that progression. So just a reminder of the team, we build about 100 different Azure SDK libraries in Python, JavaScript, .NET, Java, and Go. So we work with lots of kinds of developers who have really different needs in terms of what they expect from a library, how they want their documentation to look, how they want their library to act and perform. So it's really critical for us to use this in understanding the needs of each language group. We also work with teams across Azure on API design and developer experience and understanding what makes an API uh, easy to work with, how you use it with all the different services. Some of the services we work with, you might recognize like Key Vault, Storage, Cosmos DB, and lots more. And then we partner really closely with VS Code. If you've used any of the Azure VS Code extensions, like the extensions for functions or app service or BICEP, which is our infrastructure as code um, language, we work on those extensions. And so there's a lot of um, great things we can study there in terms of developer workflow, how people want VS Code to help them use these different Azure features. So some of the things that we have used HPF to really dive into and understand and where we're you know, always making sure that we're going back to this learning mindset. Uh, some of these are things like error handling. So um, error handling is really interesting. Lots of different errors that developers can encounter and many different ways that you might want to handle them. This can cover everything from how you want to be messaged about the error, when you want that message, how you understand the message, uh, what kind of errors are being given. So there's a lot of different things to study. Documentation. Uh, documentation is, uh, you know, has many different aspects to it in terms of, do you want more code-centric documentation? Um, how is the getting started part of the documentation? What's documentation needed for each kind of language? So this is a place where HPF can really help you understand the needs. Another area we spend a lot of time thinking about is helping people move to new version of the SDK library. All of Azure and our Azure services are always growing and adding new features and our libraries evolve along with that. We want to make sure people are learning about those new um, versions and able to migrate to them in an easy path. That's a great place that HPF can really help. Uh, API guidelines and standards. This is a place where you can use the same kind of progression and hypotheses and learning about your customer, but it might be an internal customer, a team that you work with that you're um, building something together. That can be really helpful. Versioning and lifecycle, naming, naming everything from API endpoints, 
to package names, to actually just the terms that you use in your documentation. There's a lot to be understood there. And then developer workflows. How are people wanting to work? What do they expect? Um, are you able to fit into the different expectations of each language group? So these are some of the things where we've really dug in and written lots of hypotheses and talked to lots of developers to really understand how we can solve their problems and then are we solving the problems? Some of the lessons learned that we've, uh, I think that have really stood out to me in this process is by writing down the assumptions as hypothesis and then going and working to validate them or invalidate them, it really provides a lot of focus. Like if you take documentation as a part of developer experience, which is even broader, documentation covers a lot of different things and deciding where to focus and how to make clear progress on that. This is where HPF can be very, very helpful. Um, there's lots of ways that you can do the learning part, how you can go and validate the hypotheses. Customer interviews, usability studies, surveys, usage data, many, many more, whatever you brainstorm there. And what's been important to notice there is that the hypothesis tells us what we need to go learn, and then the tools help us achieve that learning. So that's a way that we really view that. And then another observation I've had is that using this process really can help an organization or a bunch of teams or a connected cross-organization team speak the same language. It provides a really good structure for communicating uh, goals and results. And it also gives a great structure for tracking the data that comes back in and doing the analysis and the sense making and the learning. So these are all really important parts that you start with the hypothesis, but you get to all of these as you work through the whole process. Some of the conversations that we have found really useful to have when we are working on the customer hypothesis validation and the problem hypothesis validation. These are a few examples of things that can be helpful, like really trying to understand the type of customer you're talking to and what are they really skilled in? Like, where are their strengths? What are they motivated by? What are they influenced by? Uh, spending a lot of time understanding the jobs to be done and maybe even like the jobs to be done within the jobs to be done can, can really be helpful. And then on the problem side, I think the one around understanding you know, what they might be lacking to actually get the job done that they're trying to do is a really useful one. And then do they have current workarounds? That can be really helpful to understand kind of what's causing them frustration, uh, where you might have an opportunity to solve a problem. And then here's an example of how you could use this hypothesis framework for, for a topic related to SDKs. This really dives into that migrating to a new version. So if you were taking the examples we looked at for our cardboard baler example and moving them to be about SDKs, you could write something like this specific language, pick your favorite language, developers have written code that uses an older version of an SDK and they haven't used the latest version. And so they are motivated, we believe they are motivated to minimize and avoid conflict with older versions of the SDK when they are adopting the new version of the SDK. And then you could go and test. Is there really that motive? Is really that their main motivation? Are they trying to avoid the conflicts with the older versions? Or is it something else? Um, the next one is same target group of customers, developers who have used the older version uh, but haven't used the latest one. Are they motivated to learn about a new SDK to learn what's, you know, the, the new capabilities, the new features of a new SDK, what's available without negatively impacting their existing code? Is that a primary motivation for these customers that they have when they're adopting the latest version? And you could build up, you know, many, many different versions of this, and then you can go test those through the conversations. And in the conversations, you might um, ask things like, tell me about the last time you were adopting a new version of an SDK. What did you do? What was your motivation? What were you hoping to achieve? And that can really help you dive into to the motivation parts of it. So I hope that this was super helpful to you. It's been really fun to share some of our journey. And this is a journey that we're constantly on and, and always learning about how we can build new things in our Azure DevTools team. There's some great blog posts that uh, have the links to the book, talk about some of the HPF topics I talked about today. And then there's also some great resources for the Azure SDK. We've got our releases, which always has the up-to-date releases. 
a blog where you can find tips and tricks, and then you can find all the VS Code Azure extensions. We're also hiring in DevDiv. We're hiring um, across the whole organization in DevDiv, and we're also hiring in Austin. So um, check out those links if, if that's interesting to you. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Mandy Whaley. I would love to hear from you. And you can also keep track of what's going on with the Azure SDK on Twitter with at Azure SDK. So thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful DevNet Create. Enjoy, meet, you know, participate in the chat. The community that gets um, connected through DevNet Create is one of the best, best things about it. And so happy to be here and great to see you.